Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Alan, and I'm an alcoholic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wow, you know, when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was one of the youngest people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I know that many of you would find that very difficult to believe today, but uh, when I first came to AA uh, uh, in Long Beach uh, in 1970 uh, uh, and started going to meetings, the youngest girl that was in Los Angeles County at that time was 27. She taught school, and everybody used to try to fix me up with her. and uh, because there w- weren't any young people, uh, I mean, there were so very few young people in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's unbelievable. I never dreamed that I would have a day come that I would, uh, it's almost frightening when you show up at a place and you, you think that you're, you're very out of place because you're quite old for being there. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm just about over the line now, though I'm 38 years old, so, uh, uh, you know, pretty soon I won't qualify to be here. Um, thank you. Um, Anyway, uh, going back over my life, uh, since we talk about what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now, and uh, going back over my life, uh, the thing that, that seemed to be the overriding motivator in my life was always fear. Um, I can remember at three years old that I felt different, I felt afraid, I felt ashamed for some reason, I felt like I didn't belong. Uh, even when I was going to school, I felt like I didn't fit. I felt like I didn't fit with the little other little kids that were playing on the same block. I sat at the dinner table, and many times I didn't feel like I fit at the dinner table with the rest of my family. Now, I don't know why I felt that way. Uh, I'm sure some psychologists could come up with some great reason, you know, some trauma that may have happened to me between zero and three that caused me to feel that way. Uh, but that was the type of emotions that I had. Um, I'm half Irish and I'm half Italian. I know that there's a lot of Irish people and a lot of Italians that are alcoholic. I was also raised Catholic. Uh, I know that there's uh, a lot of people uh, who are Catholics or ex-Catholics that uh, had a problem with alcohol. Um, But I have an older brother that's not an alcoholic. I have an older sister that's not an alcoholic. And uh, I have a a younger brother that is. Um, But... Uh, I don't know why I was chosen to uh, bear this cross for my family, uh, but but I was. Uh, at five years old, uh, I can remember going to kindergarten for the first time, and it pretty much summarizes what happened to me previous to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, because for weeks ahead of going to kindergarten, I mean, the fear just kept mounting because I knew I was going to have to go spend a whole day in rooms with other people. And, and I didn't get along well with other people. I wasn't real social. And, and I mean, I was really afraid of going to kindergarten. I remember on that final day, you know, my mother taking me down the street and she's got me by the hand. We're going down the street and I'm kind of dragging the other way saying, no, no, let's wait until next year. You know, and uh, she turned me over to this teacher and this teacher started taking me toward this old gloomy building in downtown. Los Angeles, and the closer that we got to the building, I, I, God, the fear, I mean, it was just, I felt like I was going to explode, and I just turned around, I kicked this lady in the leg, and I ran, you know, and uh, that's pretty much what I did until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, anything I didn't like, anything I didn't understand, or anything that I was afraid of, I just kicked at it and ran the other way. My family uh, made a lot of money for a short period of time, we moved into a very wealthy neighborhood, had a maid and a swimming pool, and all the nice uh, uh, things and and I, I can't remember that that having any major impact on my life one way or the other. I still felt the same way in the rich neighborhood that I felt in the poor neighborhood. Um, finally, when I was seven or eight years old, nine years old, the thing to do was play sports. And so I'd play baseball and I'd play football and basketball and all those types of things. And I was always pretty good at it, so I was always one of the fellows. But I never felt like I was. You see, even when I played baseball when I was a kid, I always felt like I had to try so much harder than everybody else because I wouldn't allow myself to make an error. You see, because I didn't feel like I really belonged there to begin with. And so what would people say if I made a mistake? And I put so much pressure on myself all the time to be better, not, but not so that I could feel like I was better than everybody else, just so that I could feel it was okay for me to be there. 
finally, when I was about 10 years old, uh, 11 years old, my family moved into a, we lost all our money, and a couple of my uncles went out to spend some time at the Paradise of the Pacific Terminal Island Federal Penitentiary, and uh, and we moved into a neighborhood that was kind of unique to any other neighborhood that I'd lived in before. It was the middle of the school year, I was in the sixth grade, and I was going to school, and, and previous to that time, I was a sweet, innocent little kid. I went to my catechism every Saturday, went to church every Sunday, was an altar boy, did all these different things, and... And I'm going to school, and all of a sudden I get there, and right across the street from school, all the guys are standing out there smoking cigarettes, talking trash, ditching school, beating up people, and things. I'm thinking, oh, my God, what have I got into here? I mean, I don't want to be here. Uh, I really don't want to be here. And, uh, But I have this addictive personality, and I have to prove, like, that I belong in whatever environment that I'm in, and it wasn't three months later I was out standing on the street corner with a cigarette hanging out of the side of my mouth, talking trash and ditching school and doing everything that the other guys were doing. Um, the summer between sixth and seventh grade was when I was introduced to alcohol. Uh, the thing to do on Friday or Saturday night was to have a, a friend of mine's older brother go down to the liquor store and he'd buy his gallons of Red Mountain, Vin Rosé, or Quartz of Country Club beer. And we would drink, and, and we would go down to the roller rink where they had sock hops, and, and we'd get in fights with guys from other neighborhoods. And uh, I don't know what happened to other people when they drank alcohol, but I know what happened to me. And it was like I could just flip on a switch. I mean, it was like I didn't have one day of in my conscious memory that I was really comfortable. Not one day that I really felt like I had any peace. That I, I mean, I was stressed out from the day that I was born. And all of a sudden, I could drink alcohol, and I could shut out the world. Now, I didn't become happy, joyous, the big-time partier, the life of the party. I was never any of those things, okay? I just wanted to get loaded from that day forward because I could shut out the whole world. I could go sit down in an alley or on a street corner or somewhere, and I could drink wine or I could drink beer, and I could make the whole world go away. The whole world would go away when I drank. And uh, it wasn't too much longer after that that uh, the thing to do in my neighborhood wasn't just to uh, drink wine anymore. They were smoking a little non-habit forming weed and, and I adapted to that real quickly. And I started smoking pot every day. Uh, I didn't do, I never did things in any with any type of ab or normality. I mean, I was like, from the very beginning, I would get up in the morning and I would smoke pot in the shower before I went to junior high school. Because you see, I didn't want to go out my door and be confronted with all the things that I was confronted with on a daily basis without having that feeling. Because you see, alcohol and drugs gave me the ability j really just to survive. Because, I mean, this was bad. I mean, these people were bad. I mean, this neighborhood, I mean, and I know a lot of you have come from, I mean, but these people were nuts. You know, I tried to act like it and almost became it. But, I mean, it was like, I mean, there was a lot going on. I mean, there were people getting killed. I mean, armed robberies, people carrying guns in junior high school. I mean, it was not fun. And, I mean, just to have to be around that every day, and you never knew when it was going to come back on you. So, I mean, there was a lot of fear that went along with it. Uh, I went along, uh, you know, drinking and smoking pot till probably I was 13, 13 and a half years old. Didn't have any real problem. Just did it every chance I got. Um, and then all of a sudden the thing to do in my neighborhood wasn't just uh, drink wine and smoke pot anymore. They started taking pills with it, and I started taking pills at about 13, half, 14 years old. Um, I was afraid of pills, though. You see, a friend of my mother's had taken an uh, overdose of pills and died. And so I knew that this was a little bit more serious than just like smoking pot and drinking, right? Okay, I mean, this is like drugs or something. You know, I mean, this is serious. So I, I didn't just start taking pills immediately. I, I kind of watched other people, and I waited a couple weeks. You know, when no one died... You know, I thought, well, so I guess you don't really die from pills. So um, I started taking pills. And the first time I ever took pills um, 
we got pulled right after we went and got these pills, and I had taken five of what, reds or secondals, whatever you want to call them. And I had, in the anticipation that I might enjoy them, I had purchased some extras. And uh, <coughs> we got pulled over by the Long Beach Police Department. And back then, it was not a good idea to be arrested with those. They didn't write you tickets. Uh, and uh, so... I didn't want to be arrested for possession, so I swallowed the other 25 that I had in my pocket. And uh, I really don't remember anything after that. Uh, I remember I came to, and I was in my bed, and I remember getting up and thinking, wow, how did I get here? What happened? I guess it really wasn't that bad. You know, I took 30 reds. I ought to be dead. You know, and then I found out that it was two days, two days had gone by. And I don't know where I was that two days. Was I in my bed conked out? Was I out doing things? What was really going on during that time? And, you know, one thing that I want to bring up, I, I, I brought up uh, in the beginning that I was raised Catholic. Um, and uh, when I was about 13 years old, uh, I had this realization or what I thought was a realization that everything that was fun was a sin. And uh, that I'd either have to give up having fun or give up religion. And I made a, a decision at that point to give up religion. Uh, most of what I heard as a child was not about God being a good and loving God um, and being merciful and compassionate and all those types of things that I know for an absolute fact that God is. Um, I heard more about condemnation and about sin. If you don't go to church on Sunday, you're going to go to hell. And there were a lot of rituals and traditions that I didn't necessarily take to that well. Uh, so I gave up the religion. But I have to tell you that the only reason that I'm standing here today is because of that God, because there, there's absolutely no other way. Uh, that first time on pills was just one of so many times that were even worse than that. OK, that somehow or another I lived one more time. I mean, it, it got to be a joke. And I know that that, you know, I can't lay credit to any of that. that the only reason uh, that I could be alive is because those little guardian angels that they told me about in church as a little kid have been watching over me since the day that I was born. And I know that. Uh, and I took them a lot of very strange places. Um, places I'm sure they didn't appreciate. Uh, but uh, um by the time I was uh, 15 years old, I was probably taking between 30 and 40 reds a day. I was uh, smoking pot. I was drinking. I would sniff glue. I would do whatever it was. Uh, I was really never much of a leader. Um, I mean, I wasn't really much of a follower either. I'm not sure exactly what I was. I, I wasn't much of anything. I just wanted to get loaded all the time. I wanted to be loaded 24 hours out of the day because if I wasn't loaded, then I would start to think about myself. And I hated me. I hated everything about me. I was so ashamed of what I was. I never set out in life to become any of the things that I was becoming. And it was like this chain of events. It was like I took a first drink of alcohol, and all of a sudden, I mean, I just went on this rip-roaring terror for a number of years of just going downhill. I mean, downhill so fast, on a daily basis, I found new lows. And all the while, I'm sitting back going, what is happening to me? I don't want to be this person. I don't want to steal things from people. I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to beat people up. I don't want to rip people off. I don't want to do burglaries. I don't want to do armed robberies. I don't want to run around with people who kill people and don't think anything about it. And yet, those were the people who did all the same things that I did. And... Finally, at 15, I got thrown out of school, and the thing to do, just ran around the streets most of the day. One day, we went over to get some pills. The guy who sold pills wasn't home. One of the other guys in the car was five years older than I was, and he said, well, why don't we go get some heroin instead? And I said, fine, and we went and got some heroin. From that time on, I'd shoot heroin and take pills and drink wine and smoke pot. I got arrested a lot. I got arrested someplace between 30 and 40 times uh, between the ages of 12 and 18 years old. Uh, I got arrested almost every single time I was ever arrested was for under the influence of possession of alcohol and or drugs. 
You know, I mean, I, I was never, I never carried a gun. I never shot anybody, thank God. Uh, I knew I was a chicken. Well, that's why I didn't want to carry a gun. The other guys can carry guns. If you carry a gun, you might have to shoot somebody. Because if you point it at them, they might pull out theirs, right? You know, and then you got a big decision to make, you know. Uh, it's like, okay, you know, it's your decision time. Do you want to spend the rest of your life locked up? You know, or uh, do you want to just let this person take your life right there? And so I, I never really liked guns. Um, my specialty on the streets, I guess if I had one, not that I was that good at anything, but I talked a lot. Uh, you know, it's like I used to sell people things that I didn't have. Um, it was a lot better than being violent. You know, I mean, I never, I never was into that. But to give you an idea, I mean, I was never cut out to be an alcoholic or to be a drug addict or to live that lifestyle. Because I can remember as a kid us doing a burglary, and this is when I was strung out on heroin. We went out, we did this burglary over in Lakewood. We went in this house, and the minute we got in the house, there on the kitchen table was a lady's purse. This friend of mine, he grabs his purse, he rips it open, and inside it's $180. And the thought that went through my mind at that time was that she's probably divorced, you know, she probably has three kids. This is going to pay her rent and feed her children for the month. And here we're going to rip it off to shoot stuff. And my partner said, man, I mean, bonanza. We don't even have to look any further, you know. I mean, and, uh, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, God, back then you could get a quarter ounce of heroin for $60. And I'm thinking, you know, why not just take 60 <laughs> you know. And I was like... And, I mean, these guys looked at me like I was absolutely nuts. I mean, they just must have dropped me off of a spaceship, right? But that was what went through my mind. I didn't want to hurt anybody. I really didn't. You know, I mean, it used to kill me all the times that I'd get arrested. My mother would come down there to the jails, right? And she'd stand there. My mother weighs about 90 pounds and, and black hair and brown, big brown eyes. And she would sit there and she would cry and she'd ask me, why, Alan? You know, Why? I mean, I work 18 hours a day cleaning apartments so I can put a roof over your head for you and your younger brother, okay? Have you ever one time not had decent clothes to wear? Have you ever one time gone hungry? Have, once in your life, have I ever failed to give you anything, Alan? I mean, I know that we haven't had the best of conditions, but have one time have I ever let you down? Why are you what you are? God, when they call me and they tell me the things that you've done and the type of person that you are, I can't believe this is you. And you just hang your head down. And I mean, and you choke back the tears and you get out of jail and you get back out there. And you say, this time it's going to be different. This time I'm never going to do any of those things again. I really want to be something in life. I don't want to be this. But you get back out there and you go back and you show up on the street corner again and here's all the guys and they say, hey man, do you want some of this or do you want some of that? And you go, well, I'm just going to do this one time. I'm not going to get back into this again. But maybe I could just celebrate my getting out just once. I could get high today. But tomorrow I'm going to go get a job. Tomorrow I'm going to go try to get back in school. Tomorrow I'm going to go do this. And before you know it, you know, it's all over again and you're back in the same jail cell saying the same thing over and over and over and over again. And that was my life. One time when I was uh, released, after spending a few months in, in the California Youth Authority, I was introduced to a man. He had moved in the apartment across from me, uh, uh, from my mother. Um, he had just got married, and um, uh, his wife was just a real sweetheart. And one day, my mother was out at the mailbox, and... Uh, uh, they, these two ladies got talking, and this lady could see that my mother was really hurting, and she asked my mother what was the matter, and she said, well, you know, I have a son, he just got out of the youth authority, he drinks all the time, and, and he was in for heroin, he got back out, and I know he's back shooting heroin again. And this lady said, well, you know, well, that's wonderful, because my husband's a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and my husband spent time in San Quentin and Folsom, and did all these different things, and, and you ought to have you know, Alan, come over and talk to my husband. And, and uh, you know, I, my mother comes home and she says, 
I want you to go meet this man, Johnny Allen. I mean, this guy was in San Quentin, and he was in Folsom, and he did all these things, and, and uh, you know, he's been clean and sober now for seven or eight years, and, and I, I really think you should go talk to him. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. You know, right. Yeah. A lot of guys from San Quentin, Folsom, and all these guys are, you know, in AA now. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I never saw anybody from my neighborhood ever change. You know, the only thing that ever changed, I mean, they died, they went to jail, they got varying sentences, you know, they went to different institutions, but I never really saw one ever change their life. And I really didn't believe that someone who had done all those things really could. Uh, so being the skeptic and somewhat paranoid that I am, I would not go talk to this Johnny until I checked him out a little bit. You know, and I first thing that you can tell about somebody is go see what kind of car they drive, right? You know, tells a lot about a person. He drove drove a white four door Plymouth with uh, no chrome. For those of you who are unfamiliar with enforcement agencies, this is the kind of car that most narcotics officers, the FBI, you know, people like that drive. I mean, it's like, I mean, this is bad news. I'm thinking, I'm, I go out there, I take one look at the car, I say, my God, my mom's trying to set me up, you know. <laughs> and... Finally, after a few weeks of being prodded, you know, Alan, would you go over and see Johnny now? He's home, you know, because I'd, I'd wait and I'd go out and I'd look and this car wasn't there. Then I'd go knock on the door, you know. And uh, so finally, one night I came down the stairs and I just shot some heroin. I'd been drinking and taking a few pills. I had on a pair of khakis, no shirt, a pair of sandals. I weighed about 115 pounds. I was white as a sheet, had big dark circles around my eyes. And my mother said, uh, hey, Alan, uh, Johnny's home now. Why don't you go over and talk to him? I'm thinking, oh, God. And anyway, I went over and knocked on the door, and I really don't remember that much about any dialogue. But for those of you who are, know him, and I, I know there's a number of you here that do, you know, he folded his arms. He had this real cold, stern look on his face. He's, you willing to do anything to stay sober? And I said, no. And uh, he said, okay, looking the way you look, it's inevitable. You'll get arrested pretty soon. So when you get arrested and they send you wherever they're going to send you, you write a letter and I'll come visit you. And I got up and I walked out with my first resentment. Uh, uh, how dare this guy say I look so bad I'm going to get arrested. But anyway, um, I had really reached a point in my life. I was uh, 16, 17 years old. I had really reached a point in my life where things really didn't even work for me anymore. I mean, I would shoot heroin every day. I would take my 20, 30, 40 pills a day. I would drink. I would smoke pot, you know, and I would do all these things. And I would get in bed at night and not be able to fall asleep. And I would sit there and think about my life and think about what I am and who I am and how afraid I was and where I'm going to die and things like that. And those were the kind of thoughts that went through my head at night. Uh, I didn't, drinking and drugs was not fun, it was survival. It wasn't party time. It was, I mean, it was a grind. It was a daily grind, okay? And if you could get, it got to a point where if you could get two or three minutes out of the day that you actually got that sense of peace again or that sense of relief, I mean, that was big. And during that same time, at that same time that I, that I met that man, I also, I mean, Christmas Eve of that year, which was just a couple of days later, I knew that I didn't want to live anymore. I knew that I was going to spend the rest of my life as an alcoholic and a drug addict and, or locked up inside some institution, and I didn't want to do it anymore. So I went out and took an intentional overdose of heroin. I came to in a bathtub three and a half hours later filled with ice cubes and cold water and got shooting milk and salt in my veins and walking me around a backyard in Paramount at midnight on Christmas Eve, walking me by the, holding onto my arms, walking me around. And I'll say, keep walking, brother, keep walking. you got to keep walking or you'll die. And I thought, wasn't this the idea? <laughs> yeah. I got run over uh, my neighborhood myself and three other guys had actually got started a gang war with another neighborhood at that time unintentionally we weren't really trying to do that I just ripped a guy off for three bucks uh, but anyway 
Um, so there, there were gang fights all the time, and these guys would cruise my neighborhood, okay, just waiting to find somebody walking down the street by themselves or whatnot. And so this one day I'm loaded, and I'm walking across the street, and I see this Lord Chevy coming around this corner. And I'm going, oh, no, because I knew it wasn't one of ours. You know, it's like, you know, you know who's, your, you know, it's like in the war, you know, you know, the planes, you can tell by the insignias, you know, the cars, you, you knew, you know, you had a scorecard for whose cars were whose, and, and I knew this wasn't one of ours. And I'm in the middle of the street, and I'm going, oh, man, this is not good, you know. And uh, these guys figured, I guess, that, uh, you know, I mean, hey, why get out of the car and beat the guy up? Let's just run him over. He's out there in the street anyway. So so this car hit me at about 40 miles an hour, and uh, I flew down the street. And, uh, and I mean, I was really surprised when I hit the ground. Uh, you know, I thought, well, that wasn't so bad. And I got up and I walked away and I flipped him off when I left. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't want to try to do that again. But, uh, you know, I'm just telling you, this God has been watching out for me since the day that I was born. A um, couple weeks after that, I was arrested. I was uh, sent out to a youth authority institution in Chino by the name of YTS. I had been out there for three or four months, and all of a sudden I remembered this guy, Johnny. And I said, well, you know, maybe there really is something to do to this. I wrote a letter uh, following Saturday morning. As soon as visiting hours opened, he was there to visit me. And he sat down, he talked to me for three hours in the visiting hall, and there was a very, very close identification that I had with his story. Um, and he said, they have meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous inside here every Sunday night. I suggest you go to him. And I started going to AA inside Chino in 1969. I was 17 years old. Um, I didn't believe the people who came in, the guys who came in on the panels. I thought they were smoking weed on the way home, going, hell yeah, can you believe these guys actually believe that story? You know, um, you know, I mean, I was just like, I mean, I, it just seemed impossible to me. But somewhere down the line, finally one speaker came in, and what, this one speaker really motivated me. Uh, I mean, he had something. Not something, he had something spiritually. He had a depth. He had a, something about him that was different than the other people who came in. And he said the way that he found it was by working the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I went back to my cell that night, and I got out the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was going to work these 12 steps because I want this freedom. I don't want to live the way that I was living anymore. I did not want to li spend the rest of my life staring at orange night lights and shadows on bars of the walls in the middle of the night asking myself where it's all going to end. Am I going to spend the rest of my life locked up in places like this? Am I going to turn up in a trash can in some alley? Am I going to die of an overdose and get dumped on a front lawn of a hospital because your friends are too afraid to even take you in? You know, because that's what happened every day. That was life. That's what the life was. That's why it's nice that we can come to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and conferences and things like that and laugh about this. But I'm going to tell you something. This disease kills. That's what this is all about. This is about saving our life. You know, for many of us, if we ever take another drink, or if we ever put any more drugs in our systems, we will never see these doors again. You know, we're going to be in forest lawn if we're lucky. And that's if they buy a nice plot for us. Okay? Which they probably wouldn't. Okay? But that's what the disease of alcoholism is. And that's the thing that I have to remember. See, today, drinking and drugs are not an alternative for me. Period. I don't drink and I don't take drugs. It wasn't always like, anyway, I got out the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I could kind of admit that I was an alcoholic. I really didn't like being an alcoholic. I didn't want to be an alcoholic. My dad was an alcoholic. He drank in bars. He slept in cars. You know, he left his cigarette lit and burned up cars and, you know, things like that. And that's what alcoholics do. And I had never done any of those things. And I thought there was a little bit more prestige in being a drug addict than an alcoholic. You know, I thought maybe, you know, somewhere down the line, if you're a junkie, that's cooler or something. You know, it's sick. Uh, but... I said, okay, if i got to be an alcoholic to do this, I'll, well, I'll, I'll try that. In fact, I didn't really have a big problem with step one, two, or three. Really, I mean, even though there's really not a hell of a lot required of you in step one, two, and three, really, when you get right down to it. In step four, it said that I was going to have to sit down and write out an inventory, and I was going to have to put down on paper things that I would not admit to myself were true. Things that when they came into my mind, when my memory was jogged and these things came back up in my mind, that somehow, some way, I would find a way to get loaded. 
whether or not it was vanilla extract, you know, from the kitchen, okay, whether or not it was pruno that somebody made in the kitchen, whether or not it was Prepsol from the paint shop, whether or not it was shoe glue from the shoe shop. And if all other avenues failed, you could always take your handkerchief and dip it in the gas can of the lawnmower in the nursery and gardening department and get high on the gasoline. But somehow, some way, you got to push this out. Anyway, it said in step four that I was going to sit down and I was going to write these things down on paper, things that I honestly and truly could not admit to myself were true. Things that haunted me. And then in step five said that I was going to admit to God, to myself, and to another human being the exact nature of what these things were. And I closed the book. So, well, I guess uh, I guess this isn't for me because I'll die before I ever do that. For those of you who are new, uh, ask somebody who's been around here a long time just how many people have died because they wouldn't do that. You know, I don't know about you, but all my life I've had little voices that talk to me in my head. Okay. They started talking to me when I was a little kid, okay? And unfortunately, most of my life, my life, I listened to them, okay? They were what told me that I was different from other people, that I didn't fit in, okay? I mean, sometimes they can be really subtle, too. You know, it's like, uh, oh, what's the use? You know, every time you try anything, you know, oh, screw it, just go get loaded, you know, or, you know, you don't have to do this all the time. You could just do this once, you know, and, and the thing that the voice told me, though, when it came to the fourth and fifth step was, you know, you could never tell anybody that you could never do that, Alan. I mean, can you imagine? You see, because as long as we're controlled by those voices, As long as we hang on to our past, the voice stays in control. I mean, it's a real psychological game that's going on there. I mean, you know, as long as they can keep you ashamed and keep you afraid, um, it keeps control, just like a, like a game. Anyway, um, I got out of that institution after a year. I stayed sober for 19 days. After 19 days, I went out and got drunk again. Stayed drunk for three days. And during that three days, <clears throat> I, I mean, I just went off the deep end. Uh, I started drinking. I started taking drugs. I went in my house, and uh, my mother looked at me. I mean, the minute I walked through the door, and she says, Oh, my God, not again, Alan. You know, I'm calling your parole officer. And she went over, and she grabbed the phone. And I mean, I just blew it. I went into a rage and I ran over and I grabbed the phone and I ripped it out of the wall and I threw it right through the window and I went over and I grabbed her by the throat and I put her up against the wall and I said, so help me God, if you ever try to do that again, I'll kill you. And I just, I just thought, I stood there and I saw myself and I thought, my God, you know, I'm an animal, man, I'm not even human. This is my mother. I mean, this is my mother who cleans apartments to buy cartons of cigarettes and coffee so that she can get on buses on Saturday and Sunday and float around the state of California to come visit me. She's the only one who still comes. And I walked out the door, and three days later I tried to come home. And I was standing there at her door, and evidently she called the police. And the police came up the, the walkway from the alley, and they said, Hey, Alan, why don't you step out here into the alley for a minute that we have something we'd like to talk to you about. When I was drinking and using, I was always real gallant, even though I wasn't very tough. I was gallant. Um, and I said, Hey, punk, if you have anything to say to me, you can say it right here. And uh, they knocked me out right there on my mother's doorstep. <laughs> And I remember looking up, stand, laying there, you know, and I remember coming to and looking up and, and seeing my mother just standing there in the doorway just crying hysterically. And they took me and threw me in the back of the police car back down to Long Beach City Jail where I'd been many, many times before. 
And it was all over again one more time. You see, I actually believed for a year going to Alcoholics Anonymous while I was inside that institution that, that I could actually have a chance at life, that I could live a normal life, that like I could have a job, I could have a family, I could live in a house, you know. I mean, I could actually be like a human being. I mean, that this is actually possible. And the parole board told me when I left Chino that if I got arrested for littering again, I'd finish out my expiration date. My expiration date was two and a half years away, and here I am waiting to go back and do another two and a half years after three days of drinking and using. And I laid in there in, the, in that jail cell, and I mean, it was like, it was all over. There were guys in there that I knew. You know, and they're standing around talking their trash, you know, and they're, you know, if they stole five dollars, they're talking about stealing five thousand and things like that. And I didn't want to do that anymore. I laid there on that bunk. And on a Sunday night, it was like many times in my drinking and using, I turned to God. Many times I used to say, God, if they would just lose the evidence. God, if they would just accidentally release me. Okay. God, if I ever get another chance at this, I'll go to church on Sunday when I get out. Okay? I mean, I did that a lot. Uh, this time, I knew I wasn't getting out of jail. There was really no point in that. There was just nobody else left to turn to because the last time I called my mother, she said, Alan, you made your choice. That's it. I don't want to see you ever again. I mean, it's not that I don't love you. It's just that I can't even stand to look at you anymore. And... I laid there on my bunk, and I mean, I turned to God. I mean, because that was it. It was just me and God, and that, there was nothing else. And all of a sudden, I mean, there was this light. I mean, there was this power. There was this force. There was this energy that was there that all of a sudden there was a peace that came over me. The next day I got up and I walked down in front of the judge, and they had no record of me ever being arrested before. And because I was only in for under the influence, they turned me loose on my own recognizances, much to the amazement of the parole department later on. Um, <laughs> and uh, I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous willing to do anything to stay sober. And back then, I, I thank God for the sponsor that I had at that time because um, he really helped me to change. Because I didn't walk like other people. I didn't talk like other people. I didn't act like other people. I mean, you knew where I came from when I walked into an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I had the walk. I had the talk. I had the whole lingo from doing time. You know, I was a convict. I was a drug addict. I was a low rider. I was all those different things. And, and I mean, it was obvious. Um, and I'd be, well, we'd be walking into a meeting, uh, you know, he, for many years was like my own dad. I mean, we were, we were that close and, and, uh, we'd be walking into a meeting and, and, uh, I'd have my shoulders out and, you know, walking in cool and he'd stop right on the way walking in. He said, why do you walk like that? <laughs> I said, walk like what? You know. He says, uh, you know, I mean, you, know, you don't get paid for being cool out here anymore, Alan. You know, he said, I'm tr I tried that myself. It just doesn't work, really. You know, I said, just okay, loosen up a little bit. In fact, you smile every now and then, too. No one will think you were a sissy, you know. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm thankful. You know, I mean, I, I got out of jail, uh, you know, when I came out in AA. I was 18 years old. I had one pair of pants and one sweater. I worked in a car wash for the first one year that I was sober. I made $1.40 an hour. I can remember saving up for two months so that I could buy one nice pair of slacks to wear to meetings. I didn't have a car till I was a year and a half sober because I couldn't afford one. I didn't have the money. Um, I went to a lot of meetings. I got active in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, when I was 30 days sober, I did my fourth and fifth step, something that I swore that I would never do. Um, and all of a sudden, things were just sailing along. You know, I mean, at two years sober... I got a job uh, in sales, uh, and uh, from the day that I got into sales, I was really good at it. You know, I mean, it was like, I mean, it was just so easy with a card, you know, I mean, you know, a phone number, you know, things like that. I mean, it just gave you all sorts of credibility. Uh, but, I mean, from the day that I got into it, it was something that I really enjoyed doing, that I was really good at. 
And little by little by little, I got to be more successful at it and make a little bit more money. I got married to a girl in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, um, you know, we had uh, um, a little uh, baby girl. Uh, and um, I can remember, you know, standing there in the in the hospital looking through the window with my sponsor standing there saying, you know, it sure is a long ways from Chino, isn't it, Alan? You know, and my daughter, uh, when my daughter was born, uh, um, you know, I named her, her name's Antoinette Allen Farrell, AA. Uh, and um, the doctor came out and he said, uh, you know, I think she was about, uh, you know, five pounds, eight, eight or nine ounces or something like that. And I said, oh, no, I said, it's five pounds, seven ounces. You know, and my mother-in-law, my mother said, well, you know, why five pounds, seven ounces? I said, well, I've been sober for 57 months, you know. And uh, sure enough, there's a certificate, five pounds, seven ounces. But, I mean, not that, I mean, this it really doesn't have a correlation. It was just a lucky guess. Uh, anyway, but... Uh, I did a lot of speaking. They started sending me different places to talk because I was somewhat of a novelty. I'm, you know, here I am. I'm 21, 22, 23 years old. I've got numerous years of sobriety. I have this story that, you know, people wanted to hear, I guess. And so they were sending me different places. And you go talk at meetings, and people tell you how wonderful you are afterwards. And you know, gee, has, you know, God, what a story, you know, and all the kind of stuff that you hear when you do speaking in Alcoholics Anonymous, which is really dangerous, by the way, very, very dangerous thing to get into. Um, because you start getting a warped um, view of yourself. It's not as easy to detect all the defects of character that we still have, no matter how good we look on the outside. That you have jealousy, you have fear, you have resentment, you have greed, you have a lot of the defects that it talks about. Okay, and you're going to meetings and you're being active, right? You're picking up chairs, you're putting up chairs, you're doing all this, you're starting meetings, you're doing all these different things, and you're really involved in the activity of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was involved in the activity of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I was not involved in growing along spiritual lines, which it says in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous is the one thing that we absolutely have to do because the day is going to come where we will have no mental defense against the first drink. And that the only thing upon that day, it's not going to be, not to say that setting up chairs and picking up, you know, cups and ashtrays and driving people back and forth to meetings are good things. They're great things. They're great things. But the one thing, the one thing that's going to bring us through on that day is the relationship that we have developed with a power greater than ourself, namely God, which is what they call him in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's going to be the thing. Okay. And I sailed along in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of my dependency, a lot of my faith, even though I talked about God from the podium, I didn't know anything about God. I mean, I still had the God I had when I was a little kid going to church. And he didn't sit well with me then. He didn't sit well that well with me now. You know, I didn't really know anything about God, and I didn't take any time to learn anything new about God. And very honestly, a big I look back today, and in some ways I placed my sponsor in that role. Okay, whatever he said, whatever my group said, you know, and I mean, I would go along with that, you know, and yet sometimes it was very uncomfortable to me. I did not agree. I didn't agree on all the issues, but I didn't even feel like I had that right to not agree. Well, who am I? I'm just a punk kid. I'm 22, 23 years old. You know, I got a couple years sober. And these people got 20, 50 years, right? And but my faith got to be too much in people. And not in God. Consequently, I mean, my marriage, I had trouble in my marriage. I would go home, my wife would tell me, you know, you're really a rude, inconsiderate, da 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 da, you know, and I think, well, that's not what they told me at the meeting, you know. <laughs> but I'm sober today, aren't I? So big deal. So you didn't drink today, you're still rotten, you know. And she was right. She was right. I had a lot of things wrong with me. Hey, I didn't walk through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous because I don't drink today. My problems just began. Because 
I got to grow up emotionally and mentally and spiritually. That's been my problem. That's why I drank. So because I come and sit, anyway, I did not work the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. There were two steps that I left out almost entirely. And they're not two steps that are talked about a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous, unfortunately. It's step 10 and step 11. I didn't sit down at the end of the day and review my day to see where I had been inconsiderate, to see where I had been fearful or greedy or any of those types of things, to see where I was wrong in a situation and try to rectify and make amends for that situation. I didn't uh, seek through prayer and meditation on a daily basis to develop a, a relationship with a power greater than myself. I didn't do that. I may have sat down a few mornings and had a cup of coffee and a cigarette and talked to God, you know, for five minutes, said, you know, hey, God, thanks a lot for all the stuff you did for me. Uh, let's do it again tomorrow. <laughs> But as far as learning anything about God or doing anything about that, you know, I, I really didn't do that much about it. Anyway, as time went on, I got further and further away from the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I got successful. I, I became totally obsessed with money and power. Okay. Um, at 24 years old, I was president of the company. I owned over half of the stock of that company. I, all I wanted to do was make 30, 40, 50 million dollars, have a Learjet, stayed in Bel Air, Rolls Royce Cornish convertible. Uh, and uh, I wasn't going to let anything stop me from doing that because I was smart. I mean, look at me. I was a high school dropout. I worked in a car wash five years ago. Now I'm president of the company. Um, and, um, you know, I thought I was really cool. I mean, things were sailing along, and after seven and a half years, I went out and got loaded. And uh, um, I remember... Uh, uh, but I want to tell you something. A lot of people have asked me, why, how can you possibly go get loaded after seven and a half years? I mean, what is it that you failed to do? What was the difference? Okay. And everybody expects me to say, I quit going to meetings. That's, they want to hear that. You know, oh, he stopped going to meetings. That's why, you know, no. I'm going to tell you right now the reason that I drank and the reason I used drugs after seven and a half years had nothing to do with my attendance at meetings, had nothing to do with my home group, and had nothing to do with my sponsor. The reason that I drank and used drugs after seven and a half years was because I failed to develop a relationship with a power greater than myself. I did not have an intimate contact with God, period. Okay? My faith wasn't in God. My faith was in people. And I'm going to tell you, if your faith is in people, you'll always be disappointed. Because people are always going to fail. They can't be perfect. They can't be perfect. You know, I believe that what I'm here to do, if I'm able to be of service in Alcoholics Anonymous, that the way that I'm going to ever be of service in Alcoholics Anonymous is, one, to show people that they don't have to live the way that they're going to live anymore, and, B, help them find the power that gave me the ability to do that. And that power that did that for me is God. You know? That's what saved me. Anyway, I went out and drank, and I, I, uh, I had thought about it for quite a long time. And I remember I didn't actually start by drinking. I started by smoking pot. <clears throat> and I took this joint, and I took a hit off of this joint, and it was like my whole world crumbled. I can remember holding that smoke there in my lungs, and I remember this feeling of just a black cloud just coming down over me. And I thought, my God, you did it. Seven and a half years you just threw out. Seven and a half years you just flushed down the toilet. And this voice said, well, you may as well go for it now. See, it was the voice that a month before told me that I could probably just drink wine or smoke pot every now and then. You know, everybody who grew up in that rotten neighborhood took drugs and drank alcohol. You're probably not really an alcoholic. You're probably just a victim of your environment. You know, I mean, I had a real chatty Kathy up here, man. You know, it's like, uh, anyway, I started smoking pot every day. About a week or two weeks later, I was at a wedding, and people were, they were serving champagne, and I thought, well, you know, I mean, who far be it for me to not, I mean, you know, toast the bride. I mean, Christ, you know, I mean. So anyway, I had a little champagne. And from that point on, I would drink wine or, or drink champagne and, and smoke pot. And I did this for a while. And I tried to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous on numerous occasions. I drank all the time. 
I functioned. I was still going to my office, being playing president and things like that. And but I mean, I drank and I smoked pot all the time. I smoked pot when I got out of bed. I smoked pot before I went to bed. You know, I mean, when I got up in the morning, I fixed myself a cappuccino with uh, you know three ounces of rum and you know all these different things in it. You know, just to get in the shower. You know, I mean, I drank all the time, but I put on a suit and I acted like I was normal. You know, and I mean, I would go down there and pretend that I'm really somebody. And、um, finally,、uh, after about a year and a half of that, I was introduced to another drug that I had not taken、uh, before.、Um, I mean, it was around, but people like wouldn't pay for it or anything. It wasn't like that good. You know, people liked heroin and things like that. But I was introduced to a drug called cocaine, and.、Um, The way I was introduced to it, this girl offered me some. I was taking this other girl to the airport, and she said, "Well, would you like to do a couple of lines?" You know, okay, you know. And so I did a couple of lines and smoked a joint, and got in the car, drove this girl to the airport, and all the way to the airport, I thought, "Man, I got to get some more of this stuff." You know.、Uh, and I got back, and when I got back.、Uh, I said, well, you know exactly like what denominations do you sell this stuff in? I mean, you know, like how do they sell it? Well, you can buy like grams, or eight ounces, or quarter ounces, and so on. She went through the denominations and the various pricing structures, and、um, uh, I said, well, and it was Friday afternoon. I said, well, you know, I said, can you get me some right now? She said, well, what do you want? I said, a quarter ounce. She says a quarter ounce. She says I thought that was the first time you ever did.、It. I said yeah. I said it's not for today. I said I wanted it for the weekend. <laughs> I called her again on Sunday night because I had run out.、Uh, I mean, you talk about a bad drug for an alcoholic. I mean, we're talking trouble here, because I mean, I could just drink forever. You don't ever have to stop until you run out of money.、Uh, so I mean, you could just drink and drink and snort and drink, and I mean, you don't go to sleep. You just keep going. I mean, it's like you're out there visiting with Edgar Allan Poe. You know, I mean, it's like you just keep going and going and going and going and going, and that was what I would do. And I did this for the first month or so. And then, I mean, I got to the point where, I mean, I was snorting, you know, three, four grams of coke a day from the beginning, you know. And then I got to the point I couldn't do it anymore. This little voice said, "I'll bet you could shoot this stuff." I thought, "Bet you can."、Um, and anyway, I bumped into a girl from my old neighborhood, and、um, you know, she was talking about she, she brought up shooting cocaine, and and I said, "Well." Do you happen to have any spare syringes? And、um, she said, "Well, yeah. As a matter of fact, I do." And I had a big bag of cocaine, and so I went and locked myself up in my place.、Uh, and that's what I would do for the last six months before I got back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I locked myself up in my place for anywhere from a short time being three days to a long one being nine days, where I shot cocaine every five to ten minutes,、uh, and uh, drank alcohol, drank maybe two, three, four quarts of Johnny Walker Scotch a day, smoked pot. I got to a point where I really wouldn't go out of my bathroom because of the, all those devils had taken over the whole place. They were everywhere, and the only place I felt safe was in the bathroom. And so I would just fill up. And plus, you were burning up all the time, shooting all this cocaine. And so I would just fill up the bathtub with、uh, cold water. And I laid all the syringes out here on the floor and all the cocaine. And I would just lay there in the bathtub, and I had this mixing glass. Uh, for making、uh, martinis, and I would fill that up with Johnny Walker Scotch and ice, and、uh, I would just lay there in the bathtub and listen to Bob Dylan "Street Legal" and blow my brains out with cocaine. And、uh, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization would have been a major step up.、Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was it was unbelievable. I mean, the things that I saw. I mean, you know, the bugs crawling across your body. You know, the people always coming in there trying to find you and staring at you and going to arrest you and going to harm you and you know, then they disappear before you can catch them. You know, and all the different things that go along with the with that life.、Uh, 
Um, and I tried and I tried and I tried. I can remember one night when my home group was on Monday night in Bellflower, and I can remember going over there and uh, one Monday night, uh, and uh, I had stopped breathing maybe an hour before that meeting. I was laying there on my sofa t writing about how I was dying. And I, I remember, I, I knew that if I did one more bit of drugs that night that I was going to die. I can remember go getting my sponsor and his wife, and they came back over to to my apartment, which was not far from there, um, and watched me flush all the cocaine and everything down and break the syringes. You know, and I can remember them walking in, and I can remember her just looking at this place going, oh, my God. You know, because here's a stereo speaker in this bathroom, and here's blood all over the mirror from all the different times that I was missing. Because, you know, I was shooting cocaine. I mean, I might, one night you might shoot it 50, 60 times, you know. And, I mean, my arms are just, I mean, the blood marks all the way down both of my arms because my veins quit closing after a while. So all these little spurts are coming out under my veins. I mean, it was not a pretty sight. And yet I tried and I tried and I tried to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I stand up in, that, in my home group and I say, I'm a newcomer and I'm dying, man. I'm dying. I would do anything to be sober again. I would do anything. I'll do anything. You know, and I would be sober for 8, 10, 12 hours, and that insanity would come back, and I would have to go do it again. I could not stop. Okay, I could not stop. I remember going to the Southern California Convention with my sponsor. It was in Los Angeles that year. And it was, I mean, this was like the final time. I'm going to try this again one more time, one more time. I'm losing everything. Everything's gone. My money's gone. Everything's gone. I mean, my business is going down the tube. Everything's gone. I mean, there's nothing worth living for anymore. I mean, it's just, we're down the tubes. I go to the Southern California Convention, and I stood there in a room, and one, a real good friend of mine who I saw come to the program was the main speaker on Sunday, and there's like 5,000 people in this room. And I looked across the room, and I said, you know, I would cut off my right arm to just be a member of AA again. To just be able to be a member of AA again. And I didn't even make it to the end of the meeting. I walked out of there, and I knew that I could never stay sober again, and I could never stay clean again. And so I said, you know, if you're going to go, I mean, let's just get out of this life. I mean, I don't want to have to go through any more. I mean, because I was so bad that at the end I was trying to buy heroin so that I could start shooting heroin so that I could get off the cocaine. So finally, this little voice said, you know, there's only one way out, Alan. And I knew what that way was. And I went out the last night. And uh, I filled up two syringes, one with a gram of pure cocaine and another sp syringe with a spoon of heroin. And I tied off both of my arms at the same time, and I shot the smack in one arm, the coke in the other arm. I took a gulp off a water glass full of scotch, and I fell down on the bed. And when I fell down on the bed, I felt like a locomotive just hit, blew the top of my head right off. You know. And I looked back, and I saw me laying down there face down, and I said, Well, you finally did it, Alan. You're 27 years old. You finally killed yourself. It's finally over. You see, because I knew it was, that was the way it had to end. I mean, how many free passes can God give any one human being? Okay, I had more than my share. Every opportunity, every good thing that could ever be put into anybody's life, I had been given. And you see, during the last year that I was out there, I couldn't pray. I could not pray to God because I was ashamed to pray to God. If I was God, I wouldn't have spit on me. Okay? If I was God, I wouldn't have spit on me. So I didn't even feel like I was worthy to say a prayer. I woke up 18 hours later. Nobody found me. I didn't go to a hospital. Nothing like that happened. I just woke up. I walked around for three days asking people if I was alive. Because I thought I died and went to hell. I thought I was going to feel miserable, guilty, remorse, shame, all these horrible feelings, okay? And my spirit was just out here floating around in all this, and I'm going to feel like this for eternity. That was what I thought was going on, because I knew I died. I went back to meetings. I sat in meetings. When I'd sit in meetings, I'd see things running across my arm, and I'm slapping things. And I mean, I mean, it was it was not a pretty sight. I mean, I lost everything at 90 days sober. I 
I had my car repossessed. I mean, I lost everything. I moved back in with my mom, okay? I couldn't have got, I mean, I lost everything. At 90 days sober, I borrowed $250 so that I could buy another car so that I could take a job so I could try to go back to work. And it was a very difficult, humbling thing for me because I'd been president of the company. I mean, I really was, you know, pretty good in business. And all of a sudden, I'm out, I'm out here applying for jobs that, I mean, don't pay as much as I paid my secretary the year before. And I'm thinking, God, I mean, I sat in interviews with people interviewing me. They're going to decide whether or not I get a job. I wouldn't have hired them. They weren't even that bright. And then make it worse, I would tell them that. <laughs> the interview's half over. I'm standing up walking out. The guy says, where are you going? I said, I, said, I can't work here. He said, why not? I'd say, because to be real honest with you, I said, judging from our conversation, you really don't know that much about all this. And I said, I really have a difficult time working for people who aren't as knowledgeable as I am. I'll have a nice day, though. You know, and, you know, and I would get up and walk out. And I would tell my, spo my, go tell my sponsor, he'd say, well, did you get that job? I said, well, no, not exactly. And uh, <laughs> say, you did what? <laughs> I mean, you you got to understand how you're not president anymore. <laughs> you know, all that's gone. You need to work. I mean, we're self-supporting through our own contributions. You know, and uh, so I said, okay. And I, anyway, I, I uh, almost 11 years ago, I went to work for the company that I still work for today. Um, as a salesman making less money than what I had paid my secretary the year before. I'm still with the company, 11 years older. I've worked for two or three different divisions of the company. I was the uh, vice president national sales manager of one of our other divisions, and, you know, I got tired of traveling all over the country um, seven years ago and, and um, uh, told them that, that I didn't want to travel anymore. I got a chance to take a year off and, and uh, uh, do some spiritual seeking. Uh, and then I took over another division of the company, uh, be seven years in July, and it's been very successful. And, and I've done, you know, on a material plane, I've attained things that I never dreamed possible, more than I've ever had in my entire life. Um, not that that's a measurement of somebody's success in Alcoholics Anonymous, because I don't believe it is, but I'm just saying that that, that really has happened for me. The years that I tried, struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled and tried to achieve things for myself in terms of financial success or worldly success, it always eluded me. And the day that I gave up, okay, trying to get things, and I did what a man said to do 2,000 years ago. He said, I read the statement on my search. I looked down and it says, Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all else will be added unto you. We say it a little bit different in Alcoholics Anonymous. Sometimes they say, you know, you just come in here and you make first things first. Okay, and right now the answer, if you're new today, the, the, the idea is we don't drink. You just, if you don't drink and you put one foot in front of the other and you try to work the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, everything else will take care of itself. And amazingly enough, somehow it does. But I believe that the reason that it does is because there's this divine power that's behind all this. Okay, there's this invisible power that's behind the scenes that, that really does make it all happen. Uh, at three and a half years sober this time, I... Uh, I reached a stage where I was very much like I was at seven and a half years sober the first time. I was going to meetings. I, was, I, I did a limited amount of speaking because I didn't really want to get into the trap of, you know, going every night different places and, and, and all that because I think that sometimes you'd be better off sending them a tape because it's really not real. You know, it's just this talk, you know, and I believe it's got, I believe if anything else that Alcoholics Anonymous is a program of the heart, you know, and that's what really makes this thing work. And, and if you're just up there talking every single night, you can't, you never shut up. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see how it can remain sincere. And, um, but, at this point, I had become successful again on the outside. I had nice clothes. I had a nice house. I had a nice car. You know, I, I had these things, but inside I felt empty. Okay? I didn't have it. I went to meetings. I was a regular member. I had my home group. I went to my home group every single week. I drove people to meetings. I rode people with people when they were speaking here and speaking there, and I did some speaking on my own. I did all these things. Okay, I was working the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was doing all these things, and inside, I had a hole inside me. I didn't have it. 
I knew I didn't have it. It wasn't there. Okay? Every time I think I'm going to go to this next meeting and someone's going to tell me what it is. Right? I'm going to find it. I know if I keep showing up, someone's going to tell me what this thing is that's missing inside me. I'm sober. I don't want to take a drink. I don't want to take any drugs. You know, I have everything in terms of the material side of life. I mean, I'm successful. I I go do my job every day. I'm responsible. I'm taking care of business. I'm doing all these things. Why don't I have it? And I didn't have it. I knew I didn't have it. And all of a sudden, there was a voice. And this time, it was a voice that had talked to me all my life. But it was never the louder of the two. Okay? And it came from down in my heart. And it had always been there. It had always been a sixth sense or an intuition, okay, that when I did something good for somebody, it just kind of got this little glow, you know, that when I did something wrong, it just kind of went, oh, Alan, I'm disappointed, okay? And today I know that that voice is God, okay? And in this particular instance, God told me, Alan, you better find me because I'm the thing that's missing in your life. And I mean, for the next year, I deluged myself with every different type of book imaginable on God, spirituality, metaphysics, you name it. Because I had a lot of questions. Who is God? Who made him God? (laughs) Can I be one too? Uh... And I'd read all these different books. And and the thing, I I, I laugh about this now, but I'm going to tell you, I was in a desperate, desperate spot at this time in my life. Not that I was in danger of drinking alcohol. I wasn't in danger of drinking alcohol. I wasn't in danger of taking drugs. From the day that I got sober again this time, those are not an alternative. I may blow my brains out. I may go stark raving mad. A lot of things might happen to me, but I'm not going to take a drink and I'm not going to get loaded, period. I don't drink and I don't take drugs, period. That's the end of the discussion. I just don't do it. I may go nuts, but I'm not going to get drunk over it and I'm not going to get loaded because I already know what that's get, what that might get me. But anyway, I went on this search, and I mean... The search was intense, and I kept reading and kept reading, and I'd get more and more confused. I'd think, God, man, there's a thousand million different things everybody's saying about this spirituality, about God, about all these different things. And, and every night I'd get down on my knees and I said, God, I'm doing everything in my power to find you. I mean, I know that you want me to have a relationship with you. I know that you're, you've called me to have a relationship with you, and I'm trying to find you. But I want to know the truth. Even if it's not something I like, as long as it's the truth, I want the truth. I don't want to lie. I don't want to be deceived. I want the truth. And, and I said, so what I'll do is I'll keep reading. I'll keep praying. I'll keep meditating. I'll keep doing all these things. But please, God, reveal to me the truth so that I can believe. You know, I want to believe in you. I want to have faith in you. And, I mean, I would just keep going and going and going. And, I mean, the next year of my life was, I mean, it was, I wish I could even tell you know, all the things that happened, but it got pretty bizarre. I mean, it got very, very bizarre. It got frightening, probably some of the most terrifying times that I've ever had in my entire life. I mean, that basically some very, uh, very, very evil forces that literally were trying to destroy me, okay? Not just in the make-believe world, but in the real world. And... um and I would go to my sponsor, and I mean, it was like, I, and I thank God at that time for him and his wife, because they would see some of the things that were going on, and it was bizarre. I mean, it was things that you wouldn't have seen in a B-movie. Well, you're starting to see them in some of the movies now, uh, but I mean, uh, some of the movies that come out now, uh, Angel Heart and some of the other things that uh, have been out in the last few years, well, those things were happening, some of those things were being done to me and happening to me at that point in time when I went on the search to find God, and I mean, it was terrifying, it was absolutely terrifying, and uh, through a most bizarre incident, um, I went to the public library to to look up this particular event that happened to me, and uh, 
it referred me to all these different books. And they were all books from the Bible. And uh, I went and I got a Bible. And I started to look, you know, for what this thing is that's going on to me. And I didn't find it. And then I flipped into the back and it had a guy talking there and they had everything that he said in red letters. The name was Jesus. And I looked down and said, why worry? Will worrying add a single hair to your head? I tell you emphatically, live your life one day at a time. And I thought, my God, he must have known Bill Wilson. I look down a little further and he says, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. None can come to the Father except by means of me. And then all of a sudden, I was sitting there and my hands just started shaking and the tears just seemed like they came from the bottom of my toes and I mean it seemed like I was crying from every single pore in my whole body. And I looked down and said, none can come to me other than those the Father has drawn, and of those that the Father has given me, I will not lose even one. Not one of these that God has set aside for me will I lose. And I knew that that was the answer to my life. And I knew that all the times of the overdoses, I knew that running down, being run down by cars, I knew that all the thing is that I had someone there that he just refused to lose. It wasn't me. I didn't do any of this. I didn't do one bit of it. You know, God in his mercy, for whatever reason, has given me a chance to live. I mean, really live. I mean, my life today is unbelievable. I mean, it says, the, the motto for your convention says, follow us to freedom. And I'll tell you, I have never been so free in my entire life. Ever. I'm not a slave to what people think of me. I'm not a slave to what the world thinks of me. I don't have an image that I wear here in AA meetings and then go change when I leave the here. I don't have an image that I go take home. I'm just me. And if people like me, that's wonderful. And if they don't like me, that's okay too. Okay? And I mean, I had to at the end of this talk, and every time I bring this up in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, I get nervous to mention Jesus' name in Alcoholics Anonymous. People go, oh, God, no, he's not, not going to talk about that, is he? You know? <laughs> Jesus wrote the 12 steps of alcoholics. They were taken from the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to believe what I believe, but because I'm here, I have to say it. Because, you know, I know it's why I'm alive. It's why I'm alive. I mean, there's going to be a few people who get offended that I'm a Christian. You know, but you know what? I mean, really, when push comes to shove, I'd much rather have you be offended than him be offended. You know? I went back to, you know, when I went back to work, uh, after taking that year off, I went back into a job where I made three times as much as what I made before. Uh, financially, things have been good to me. Uh, I have a fairly large home, but that mother that I threatened to kill, my mother lives with me. She lives in two of the bedroom ups bedrooms upstairs in my house. My younger brother got sober about a year ago. He lives up in one of them, too. Okay? Uh, I have a close relationship with my family. Um, uh, six or seven years ago, um, we were all raised Catholic. Six or seven years ago at Christmas, uh, I didn't know what to get other people in my family. And I went out and bought them all a Bible and had their names printed on the cover. You know, and I mean, you, it was like dropping a bomb at Christmas dinner. <laughs> oh, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh. <laughs> My brother's not an alcoholic, but I got to tell you, five years ago, my brother started going back to church and found a relationship with himself, with Jesus Christ. And I mean, it's helped him and his whole family, his sons, his daughters, and everything else. I mean, we don't have a corner on this love here in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I mean, God has given us something here that's so unbelievable. And if, if I was to walk out of here, I mean, today, if, if you're new here, 
don't let that is the end. That's the destination. The destination isn't just the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. The destination isn't just not taking a drink. There's so much more. Don't settle for that. Because in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it promises us happiness, peace, joy, contentment, usefulness in the world. Usefulness in the world. That we can be useful people in the world. That we can radically change our lives. Because what's going to happen is if we'll work the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, it absolutely promises us emphatically in step 12 that having had a spiritual awakening. Now, I've had people say that a spiritual awakening is a higher plane of thinking. To that I say, go read the dictionary. Because spiritual means pertaining to the things of the spirit. Whose spirit? God's spirit. That's exactly what it says in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. That somehow, that if we'll put the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to work in our lives, that we're going to be reborn, that we're going to find something totally new, that we're going to become useful, dynamic people, and that God, that God is going to be responsible from that day forward. Just like what it says in step three. And what greater power could we have working for us than God? I mean, there's nothing higher. And we are truly his children. It baffled me for years trying to figure out who God was. And then I realized at the end of every meeting, we stood up, we held hands, we said, Our Father, that God is really our Father. Hey, that's a hell of a deal. I hope you stay around and enjoy it. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.